How's everyone doing today? Good. Very, very great. Awesome. Um, I'm really excited to have this next speaker up here, um, Kevin. Um, I think these options is uh, it's a great strategy for investors. Um, I started, my first one was in 2009. What I noticed is that you can increase the cash flow, um, get a higher down payment than you would uh, a local rental property. And, uh, well, in, in my experience, I hear a lot of people say, oh, don't do that. Yeah, you're going to have to get bad quality tenants. They're going to destroy the property, yada, yada. Well, in my own experience, uh, it wasn't like that. In fact, I had worse experiences with regular renters. But those regular renters are in properties I, I inherited from uh, distressed landlords. So um, I, I, I didn't say that way. <laughs> you, so anyways, um, what the beauty of the lease option is that you know, um, you help somebody whose credit challenge or doesn't have enough money for the down payment on a traditional mortgage, which is what I do. Um, you know, my name is Arthur Borja with WJ Bradley Mortgage. Uh, WJ Bradley is the fourth largest independent lender in the United States. Uh, we do an array of loan products, um, you know, government loans, uh, conventional products. Uh, we, I also work with down payment assistance programs and also credit repair programs. Um, so, if you wanted to get uh, financing traditional way, I had to qualify somebody by, you know, checking their income, their expenses, and all sorts of other things where it uh, pertains to uh, uh, getting somebody a mortgage. Well, Kevin's going to talk more about uh, lease options and how that's an alternative if somebody doesn't qualify with me. Um, and, you know, I could probably go on and on for a while, but he's the expert. He got tons of them. So, and he, he knows it by step, by step, by step. So, um, without further ado, Kevin. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I am going to be using those here because I'm going to make sure that everybody does get everything that I have to, to offer here. Thank you, Arthur, uh, John, Carl, and the Connected Real Estate Investors for having me here. We appreciate this. So, just by a show of hands, who has done a lease option before as the owner? Who has done a lease option before as the owner? Barbara, Mike, a couple of people, Arthur. Mm -hmm. And then by show of hands, who has done a lease option as the tenant buyer? The person that was, oh, John, thank you. And then by show of hands, who has actually either heard or heard much about lease options? Is this about everybody? Okay, well, as uh, Arthur said, my name is Kevin Dunlap, and tonight we're gonna be going over a little bit into the lease options. We're gonna be going into four different aspects uh, of the lease option, and we'll be going over some additional little information that will be find you'll find helpful to help get your tenant quali uh, help them get qualified to be able to buy a home whenever they're ready to buy. So I just want also want to thank you guys for taking your time out here tonight. I know it's getting close to Thanksgiving, and you could be getting ready to go to families and things like that. So I do want to appreciate your time uh, for being here. And then what you're going to learn uh, tonight, you're, you're, first of all, you're going to learn how lease options work from both the tenant and the owner's perspectives. Because there's different kind of mindsets than what the tenant has and what the owner has. You're also going to learn the pros and cons of, uh, of lease options. And actually, I already got this written on the board, uh, what you're going to, we're going to be going over. So it's a good learning how they work, the pros and cons. A third way, and this is, I know, uh, Arthur and I talked about this last week, is how you can actually make money selling a house that you do not own. And I'm not talking about doing an assignment, and I'm also not talking about being a realtor. This is a house that you can actually sell and you never actually owned it. That's what the little cost happens. And then how you can help your tenant buyer rebuild their credit. So this hopefully will be information all of you guys can learn, get you guys some stuff about to be able to use in your daily lives. And I was going to go and talk to you a little bit about my background, my history. Um, I've been in doing real estate, I'm going to sit down and talk for a moment. I've been doing real estate since 2002. Um, how many people in here have ever, ever heard of Tony Robbins or Personal Power? Okay. Back in January 1st, 2002, that was my New Year's resolution was to do that 30-day course of Personal Power. Um, about, has anybody ever done the Personal Power program? You have, Mike? So uh, right about what, the seventh or tenth day in, one of the things Tony says is, it doesn't matter what your goals are, the first thing you have to do is get your finances in order. It doesn't matter if you want to be Mother Teresa, it doesn't matter if you want to open up a soup kitchen, you cannot support yourself, you cannot support whatever your goal is. Would everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. 
So what he said is the homework assignment is go out and get a, go find a book on finances. And that's what I did. I, I had done a little bit of uh, network marketing before, so I picked up the, the very first book that I saw in 2002 is a little black and purple book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Anybody ever heard of Rich Dad Poor Dad? Yeah. I brought a kid's talk. I looked through that book and says, man, this book is way too basic for me, so I'll put it back on the shelf. Pick up the second book. And at that time, there was only three books in the series. This the second one was called, does anybody know? Cash, Cash Flow Cash Quadrant. Yes. yes. I pick up that book, and that is the book that changed my life. That's where I learned about the ESBI, learned about real estate and getting into that. And, and that, was, that just changed my life. Another thing from personal power uh, that changed my life was... Um, Tony had talked to, uh, he gave a homework assignment, and Mike, maybe you can correct me on this as well. It says, for the next 10 days, come up with three different ways to make money. Do you remember that homework assignment in there? So every morning, you write down like three or four different ways, and at the end of 10 days, you'll have 30 different ways to make money. I came up with like 34, because some days I had a fourth one, and I didn't want to cheat, and like, well, I didn't say this for tomorrow. And I didn't want to say, well, that counts for tomorrow, so I just wanted to do that. At that time, I was a college math teacher, and I was also tending bar at a, at a local beach bar in Wilmington, North Carolina. The owner of the bar happened to be, she would build custom homes. She would go and buy a, custom, uh, buy a lot on a golf course, build a custom home, live in it, sell it, and do the exact same thing over and over again. So I think that the 35th thing out of 30, uh, like one of the last things I said was, get into real estate. Yeah, I mean, I, it was the last thing in my mind, it was a throwaway. Then reading Cash Flow Quadrants soon after that completely changed my life. In 2002, the year I did that, I bought my first two houses. 2003, I bought an 11-unit apartment complex in Tuscaloosa. In June or in January 2004, I moved out to Las Vegas, started doing uh, flips. As you know, if I were in, in doing investments at that time, and everybody was buying properties. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was crazy. Um, in June, um, I got away from people I was working with. And I started a lease option company. Because even at that time, there were people that could not qualify for a loan. I mean, you, you had a heartbeat to qualify, and these two still didn't qualify. And that's the one time when uh, properties were appreciating 25, 30, 50% per year. So I would actually go and find somebody with a realtor. We would go out, uh, we'll find the tenant buyer, and, um, excuse me, find the tenant buyer, right? go out with the realtor, go find something for them. Find an investor to buy it for them, and then they would one year later be paying a 40 or 50 percent increase in price on a one year lease option. That's how I got started back in 2004. Uh, since then, obviously, the market has changed. I've, I've changed my program a little bit, and tonight that's what I'm going to be talking about it, are, are the lease options. Um, in 2005, I bought my first house. 2007, I lost it to foreclosure. So I now um, which just, you know, I, would, I, I went through all that. I went through the embarrassment of, you know, of foreclosure. This is at the beginning of the turn, uh, of the turnaround in the market. Does anybody remember that when heart started going down? Some of them dramatically. Um, so I did not tell anybody. I was so embarrassed. I, would, I did not tell anybody. I didn't even tell my family members that I lost my home to foreclosure. I said, I got rid of it. <laughs> and that's what I said for two more years. I, 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 nobody knew I lost home. I, I got rid of it. As far as they knew, I was sold. That's, that was the intention. I was hoping they would assume from my getting, getting rid of it. And, um, but since then, because uh, Arthur made that kind of uh, insinuated up front, a lot of tenant buyers are people that have lost their homes through short sales or foreclosures, and this is the perfect way to get them back into a home. A lot of homeowners that do the lease options do not want to become renters. It just, I mean, that whole concept, I'm going to be a renter, no, I'm going to be a homeowner. But the lease option is the closest thing, uh, except for seller financing, where somebody can get into a home where they can actually have that sense of ownership, you know, or intend to have ownership. So this is a perfect, perfect well, way to help people in, in that regard. And, um, and so the, essentially that is why I do this. It's, I mean, I've granted, half my clients are first time home buyers, half my clients are ex home. So if you're looking to help somebody, if you want to do this for your own, as your own investments, this is a perfect way to just help other, other people out. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over these different pieces. We're going to go over, we're going to spend about 50, probably about 15 or so minutes on each of these four. So I'm going to keep the eye, eye on, the, on the clock there, and as we're getting close to that, and this, I will also make this somewhat interactive as well, just so that you guys can uh, know what's going on. So... Uh, 
So who, who knows what a lease option is? Or who thinks they know what a lease option is? If I want to say something. <laughs> yes. It's an option to buy a property at a future date. You put so much down, mm -hmm. you have a contract, you have so much payment a month, you have an option to exercise as a later date that okay. you can buy the property. Right, okay. Yes, Mike. I'd, I'd say just putting a home on layaway, just like they do at you know Walker, a Walmart or a Target. You know, put stuff on layaway for future purchase. You know, same thing with a house. I think it's the easiest way to explain it to a seller. Does anybody else want to add anything to Jason or Mike's? Yes, sir, your name? Richard. Yes, Richard. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way to do it. Also, it should, and most of them do include an equity build-up each month that would be applied toward their down payment at the end of that lease term. Correct, and we're going to be going all, uh, all three, Jason, Mike, and Richard just said is, is all correct. <laughs> Essentially, uh, to bring it out in a nutshell, what a lease option is, is the tenant buyer buying the right to buy the home at a later time for a certain price. That price we will go over later on could be a set price on our appraised value. Now, I just want to ask you guys, what are the, what are the benefits that the uh, tenant buyer has? Uh, for good one, do you think? Anybody want to venture a guess? It can fix his credit if he's mm -hmm. diligent about his payments. Right. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what about the benefits to the landlord or the owner? Well, usually you get a better tenant in, in place that they're going to take care of it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely right. Your name? Usually. Mike. Mike, thank you, Mike. Uh, what they said is absolutely correct. So the tenant is what he's doing is he's buying the right to buy and the seller is agreeing to sell the property. So let me ask you this, and actually I'd like for you guys to work in small groups about a minute or two and discuss with each other who has the most power in the lease option. Is it the owner or is it the tenant? So I'll give you guys a minute just to do the same people that you're at right now. And just uh, find out who has the most power in the You want to actually have two contracts. You want to have a, a rental contract separate from the lease option contract. Mm -hmm. And then what you're what you saying, Mike, correct? Yes. yes. And what Mike, you were saying is correct. You, you may want to have your rental contract lean, uh, more 
uh, landlord friendly than it is tenant friendly. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's kind of what Jason was hinting at too about uh, violating the rental contract. But in my opinion, I, um, I do believe that the tenant has the, mo has the more power because the tenant has, has the right to buy. In this case, the seller is going to be obligated to sell. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that is where, to me, was where the power comes from. So the landlord cannot say, well, nah, I decided I'm not going to sell to you. You just can't do that, right? Because you're, 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 selling, the, you're selling that right. So in, so in the lease option contract, when, you, when you're putting it together, just be aware that, um, that the tenant does have the power, but the, there are going to be terms in the contract that we'll cover in a moment. It's going to be five parts of a contract that we'll cover in just a moment. Um, that will help you with that, uh, giving up the power. Uh, this is what I mean. So actually, I'm going to cover that right now. There's, there's actually five parts to the contract. So number one is going to be, hopefully anybody can see this. It's going to be the purchase price. Okay? So the purchase price, and I let your hand. Yeah. As Vivi has uh, pointed out in a few moments ago, there's, there's essentially two ways that you set the purchase price. And you were kind of hinting at this. One is going to be you're going to set the price at a specific amount that that's going to be the price during that duration of that contract. So let's say you're doing a two year contract and you're locking it in at 175. Mm -hmm. If they buy one day into the contract, or if they buy two years into the contract, it is still 175 regardless. Does that make sense? Okay. The second way that uh, I have seen, the most common way, is you go off the appraised value at the time the option is exercised. Now that can get a little bit more tricky. However, in many people's opinion, that's the fairest way to go. That is the fairest way to go because the price is going to be determined by the market <laughs> at that time. So let's assume a tenant is moving into a house and the house value is estimated to be, say, 135. They're in a house for 18 months. They decide to go ahead and buy, and it comes out to be worth 155. Now, how that price is determined is when that tenant buyer gets ready to buy, then what they can do is they go ahead and order an appraisal, an actual appraisal, determine the value of the home, and then wherever that appraisal price comes in becomes a purchase price, and that's when they open up escrow and, and do it that way. Now, of course, you may ask, what, what about the owner? What if the owner doesn't agree with that price? What if you know? Um, so in those cases, what normally is done is that the owner also orders a second appraisal, and then they bring them together, and they either average them or they come close to both the tenant, the buyer, and the owner agree on what the terms are going to be. The most common that I've seen is you just average. One comes out at 145, one comes out at 150, it becomes 147.5. Then you just average the two together. Um, so that's. That's usually the two ways that you see it. Now, can anybody think of another way that, sh that you could set the price? Yes, Mike. The loan balance at the time that the option is exercised. The loan balance? Yeah. Well, that'd be taken over like a sub two. Well, yeah, it'd be like if you go ahead and, uh, you know, every payment should go ahead in the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, there's principal pay down on that. Right. So right. Say, say if you got a house that you go ahead and, and however long and somebody goes ahead and exercise that option in 10 years, the principal, you know, the loan balance at that time will be significantly lower. With the Correct, but how do, you, how do you determine what the loan balance was again? Well, I mean, so, you know, because you can go ahead and do it just with a calculator. You figure out what, what the Well, I mean, because if you're going through a contract and say, so we're not doing a set price, we're not doing an appraised price, right. how do you determine that value when you buy? Yes, sir. You just set it yourself based on the growth rate, the projected growth rate. Right, and that's to be going off a set price. Because okay. you could say, well, the house is worth one fifty today, I'm going to do a two year contract. We're going to lock it in at 160. Yeah, so that's still doing a set price. Anybody else want to venture? Yes, sir. I think what's going to be done is uh, to have the appraisers the same rule of appraised value uh, at the time of execution of the price option term, but uh, not less than a certain amount of money. Very good. Actually, this I was going to get at. You could actually put in caps, is what I would. So it kind of, I meant as a low cap or a high cap, both caps in other combinations. For an example, let's say I'm doing uh, a contract with this gentleman here. He says, we're going to do it at 175. We're going to go off the appraised value with a maximum price of 175. So now you're, you're, you're combining the set and the appraised at the same time. So if it comes in at 160, what do I have to buy it at? If I did 175 appraised value or uh, 
the maximum 175. If the appraisal comes in at 160, what am I paying for the house? 175. No, what's it? Well, the max of 175. Right. So we 160. I'm talking about, but I'm talking about minimum. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. So, uh, so if you, we're doing a an appraised value or, or with a max of 175, if the appraisal comes in at 160, I'm paying 160. What if that appraisal comes in at 190? 175. So now I have equity on the table. How you, how, you, how you can combine these two. Now, what was your name? Julian. Julian? Julian. Julian. As Julian was saying, you could also do a minimum price, a, a minimum value. For an example, or let's go and go through the example and then we'll, we'll determine why you would do something like this. We can go in and say, okay, uh, could, it's going to be the appraised value with a minimum of 150. Okay? And the, uh, if the appraisal comes in at 130, what, what am I paying for the house? 150. What if it comes in at 180? 180. 180. 180. Why would somebody do something like that? Why would, why would an owner do that? Okay, this, will, this will protect the uh, uh, possible uh, decrease in correct body. In, ca in case the market takes, it takes a downturn like it did a few years ago, it, it protects the owner from that. What if his, uh, what if, what if his payoff from minus 145 and the, and the market goes down to 130? Now he's going to he's going to the closing table with fifteen more thousand in the pocket. You see why was why somebody might want to put a minimum cap in there. Okay, so those are your your most common ways of doing it. Back in two thousand and four, I even did I, I what I just told you there is like a hybrid of, of the, um, the set price and appraised value. In two thousand and four, I did a hybrid of the hybrid. So I, I did I what we would do was uh, we would go okay the price is going to be one seventy five. Appraised value 175 um, maximum with anything above the 175 would be an equity split of 50 50. So if the house came in at 195, what, what, is, it, what, what, is, the, what is the purchase price? Mm -hmm. So 175, 195 with the equity split of 50 50 in between, what would be the purchase price in that case? 185. So do you see, you can get very <coughs> creative on how you do this. Now, the reason that uh, you may want to do things like that is number one, be okay with leaving a little bit of money on the table. There's nothing, there's nothing worse than, a, than an investor that would go out there doing a, do a lease option and maybe say they go off a set price and they get all pissed off and angry just because the price goes up above that set price. It's like, well, well I lost all this money. Now you, you agreed to a price that was good for you at the time that you put together the contract. Be good with that. I mean, how many times have you got, gone to classes, uh, other gurus, and they say, sell that house at 80 cents or 90 cents on the dollar? Or aren't you leaving money on the table in those cases as well, so you could get a quicker sale? Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing. So be okay with that. Okay. I mean, I've I've been uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what I do, and I've been doing this for a few years now. And um, I, because what I normally do is is I connect owners, owner landlords with tenant buyers. I, I pay a middleman. I call, I call it rental flipping. Nobody else calls it. That. I call it rental flipping. As I'll do a contract with a tenant, well, excuse me, with an owner. And say we like you know so okay we'll, we'll, I'll market your home for you, and then I go find the tenant buyer and then I make I make a, a fee on the, on the, uh, in, in between those two. Now what was I going to that? Oh, um, and now that I'm a realtor, I will also say uh, my fee is X is three percent minus what I've got paid on the on the front end. Now I actually just earlier this week was talking with an owner. He goes I just I, I don't I refuse to pay you your three percent. I go, okay, well, why don't you just raise the price up another four grand and that's the purchase price. No, no, I wouldn't pay 1%. Yeah. <laughs> my, my fee in the back end is 4000 and your purchase price is one fifty nine. dollars well, Can we just do one sixty three five and you still make money? <laughs> you all said okay. He absolutely refused. And to me, what does that, what, what does that, what does that indicate for, from that owner? Greed. Pure and simple greed. Now, would I, would, if, if you were doing what I'm doing, would you, be, would you want to work with somebody that was always greedy? No. 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 So I'm okay with the fact that he went away. Absolutely. Okay. One of the things I learned, and I learned, if you start doing a lot of this with tenant buyers, um, and uh, how many how many owners, uh, investor owners, are in the room right now that actually own uh, some houses right now? Okay, a few of you. You guys, would you guys agree? And if you, uh, and I'm sure you probably will. And this is uh, main, mainly is to address the people that are, have not done their first deal yet. Or still looking for a deal. 
Would you agree, and uh, your attorney, uh, when they come into your office, would you would you agree that when a tenant or a tenant buyer or whatever uh, meets you for the very first time, do you think that is their worst behavior? Are they are, are they trying to piss you off and just want to, or you say it's their best behavior? Their best behavior. Now, if their best behavior is a, is a jackass, do you want to deal with business with them? Yeah. See ya. <laughs> Make a better time. So, just a word of advice for, you, for investors: Don't get all hung up. I gotta get somebody in this house, and you're dealing with, you know, with somebody that's being unreasonable on the front end. Why do business with them? Agents. In the How many agents are in the room? Okay. So, again, agents. Same thing. Okay. So, so that's the purchase price. Let me see here. The second uh, thing that you're, we're going to be going into on an option contract is the is what? Okay, I read that. Is the option payment? That's the amount of money that they're actually putting down to uh, to secure their right to buy the house. The tenant buyer usually puts this down on the front end. I have done deals where they didn't fully put the option money down. However, John's shaking his head in the back, you agree. Let's say if a, if a, a, a tenant buyer, what is his name, sir? Mine. Oh, what's your name? Oh, okay. John. John? Okay, let's say John's a tenant buyer and, and he's coming into a house and, um, and your name again? Terry. Terry. And Terry is the owner of the house. He uh, The option payment is $6,000, okay? For some reason, he doesn't have that money at the moment, but he still wants to do the house. Terry, would you be okay with he put down four thousand dollars now and two thousand dollars thirty days later? Absolutely. Okay, so you can negotiate that option payment a little bit. In my personal experience, I would I never like going more than two payments. You know, at least half up front, mm -hmm. and then no more than one, maybe two payments uh, on the back end. Yes, Arthur. Just want to say it's not a down payment. It's not a down payment. It's an option payment. Yes, you. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go into all the legalities of this. Do not call that payment a down payment. Yeah. Never call it a down payment. Even if they call it a down payment, you say, no, it's the option payment. I mean, if they call it a down payment more than twice, and I've already corrected them twice, I disagree with them. I, although I, they can still use the words, I just don't use the words myself. Okay? Always use option payment. And all your contracts, all your communications, all your advertising, everything, option payment. Because they're not... Down payment does means what? Yeah. It means they're putting down to purchase the house. Option payment means what? They're putting money down to have the option to purchase the house. There's a huge difference in that, uh, in just those two words. So if you take, if you get nothing else from this class and you do at least option, use that. Don't use down. Yes, sir. And a judge would go ahead and look at that as like uh, you know a sale. Well, a sale exactly. And it, uh, it's know. not a sale. It's a right to buy. It's not a sale. If you want to do a sale, I'm not going to go into this. You're not going to do an option agreement or a lease option. You're going to be doing what's called a lease purchase. Completely different animal. Okay. A lease purchase, uh, and, and just to go over that real quick, a lease purchase, the seller is selling the right to sell, and the tenant buyer is, uh, is, is must buy. Absolutely, they're obligated to buy. So we're not going to go to that. That's a completely different thing. We're going to talk about lease options, also known as rent to own. But we're not going to talk about lease purchase. Completely different. And thank you. Thank you, Mark. Where am I? Okay. Um, oh, option payment. So on that option payment, what normally happens is uh, how I normally do it, and it, and it differentiates uh, in, uh, for different parts of the country. Uh, how I normally do is I usually have them put down between two and three percent of the value of the home. Some people go as high as five percent. Um, we start going higher than that. Now you're getting again into. Uh, Areas of equitable interest and all these other uh, legal things. So you want to, you don't want to charge too much, but you don't want to charge too little either. Now, yes, Mike. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask you a question real quick. When you're doing, this was just on a, a property that I was trying to do um, as a lease order? option with. As okay. I, yeah, I, I was letting people come to me, okay. and I always have them separated, the lease and the option. Yes, please. You still, when you do your lease, you still. I do as myself still have the normal lease deposits. Would I stick, um, stick with that? Security or would that be deposits. Some, yeah. It's up to you if you still want to collect them or not. Okay. I normally do not. However, you can. 
uh, still do that. Um, and yes, you have. Uh, well, here's what we do with the security deposits we get. If they practice their options, those deposits go towards the purchase of the house. Yes. And we do that. I would say um, any. Uh, this is getting a little bit more detail than I wanted to go into. I'm sorry. But you're absolutely right. If they were to put down a security deposit and then they bought the house, then yes, 100% of that security deposit goes back to them. They can apply it toward the purchase of the house, but it is their money. Right. Because do I, and the same thing with a pet fee. So yeah, that's the. Well, I mean, uh, we have the pet fee up front as well. And because the, the way I look at it is if, we, if they got a pet fee or security deposit and they're buying the house, to the owner that's selling the house, how much damages did he receive? Even if the tenant buyer destroyed the house, how much damages did he receive? Zero. Zero. That's why, like you just said, you give it back to him. Because you have to have reasonable cause to keep their security deposit. But if, a, but if an option fee up, up front is bigger than most... The well, option fee up front is usually between 2 to 3% of the value of the home. It's usually going to be significantly more than a security deposit. So then why even, would, why would usually even more? more than twice the security deposit. So then why would you need to deposit? It's that's that's your own it's personal your own Because they are different. You're doing an option and you're doing a lease. He, he, he's right. doing it. If, if they so, don't go through yeah. with it, though, you still get the, the option. Right, right. but Correct. I'm having a regular lease agreement. Because he, he's looking at them as, Mike is looking at as two different animals. If you hide the lease behind your head, the lease agreement, the lease option behind your head, he still has a fully executable, it looks like a rental agreement with security deposit. That's how he's doing it. Another thing that he could do is, let's say, and we'll go over to this, let's say the option payment is $5,000. Let's say his security deposit is $1,500. Could he say, hey, um, I don't want to charge him $6,500 to move in, can he just say, no, I'll give you a $3,500 option payment and put $1,500 security deposit and still get his $5,000? Can you be creative like that? Right. Well, so if you if you want to charge security deposit, you got to reduce this, or you know just so that you can. No, I'm it. open to everything. I was just trying to you know see what what the norm is, what's going on. I with don't that. need to charge security deposit okay. because the option payment is done. However, I do. I'm, I am a realtor. I do um, market my broker's um, uh, homes as well, and because all of his homes are through property management. They are the property manager requires the security deposit. Right. So yes, you you you, you can't charge them. Just you know, just let them know. Just be just be aware that the more you're charging up front, the less likely you're going to get somebody in the house. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if if the rent is fifteen hundred, the security deposit is fifteen hundred, and the option payment is say five thousand, right. that's eight thousand dollars for them to move into a house. Mm -hmm. If you don't charge security, it's sixty five hundred. So it's going to sound a little bit more appealing. And that's, that's a judgment call. I was just going to add to it. If um, yeah, if the market plummets, then you're not stuck owning a house that you know is worth way less than your loan amount. So that's another benefit to it. But, but, but still, though, we'll just rename the same thing. As far as the option fee is, as far as calling a deposit, I'm looking at it from the from the landlord's perspective. Like you call it, a, you call it a, a option fee up front. If they don't exercise the option, you keep the five grand. That's Correct. more than a deposit. Well, because the deposit is refundable, mm -hmm. so that's that's well, where the five grand is not. But what you're saying is is the fifteen hundred or whatever the deposit is isn't refundable if they decide to exercise their option. You're saying the fifteen hundred goes towards the no, 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 no. If they exercise their option, the fifteen hundred they get back uh, in addition to their option money. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of the same thing? If they don't exercise their option, they lost the five thousand, and the, the fifteen hundred is at jeopardy as to what the landlord sees as, as damages that were done to the property. So the tenant would get the fifteen hundred back minus damages. So and that's why I like to take that security deposit up, the security deposit, just in case they don't practice that option money. I don't even think about. I'm worried about those deposits in case something happens to that property. And they're out of there. Mm -hmm. I do have because you know it could be a lot of money to repair a house. Okay. Well, and that's so we'll inter, go over, we'll go over that. The deposits might not cover, so then I take out the option, and that covers. And we're going to go over that in the section two, the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So, and the next, the next two I'm going to write up here are actually um, they were kind of tied together. So, right. And those are your rent and your rent credit. Okay, um, when you're doing when you're doing a lease option, um, normally you're going to be charging at least market rent as your base rent. I call it your base rent. And then on top of that, you're going to be 
normally you add an additional rent credit uh, to that. For an example, let's say that if a house rents for $1,300, you may actually say, you know what, if you're going to do a lease option on this house, it's going to be $1,500 with a $200 rental credit. <coughs> Meaning, the tenant buyer, every time they make a, a $1,500 payment, they're getting $200 added on to their, um, um, to their uh, amount that they have toward, toward the purchase of the home. Does that make sense? So far, okay. So, uh, and this, I, I don't know if you said this earlier, about you make more money on, on the lease option. This is where you make your more money on the lease option because the tenant, the tenant buyer is paying that extra rent credit as well. If they don't buy, you make a higher premium on the house. If they did buy, you may market rent on the house during the rental period. So it's, it's a, in, that, in that kind of scenario, it's a no-lose situation. Now, some people don't charge a rent credit. And again, we're not going to uh, talk about this because of something known as equitable interest. Same thing uh, as far as the, having two contracts in one document, it's also equitable interest. Uh, where I would say do your own research on that. You'll find out, and I was talking to him earlier today and being an attorney, equitable interest is more just a scare tactic. It just means they have, right, it just means I have right, uh, equitable rights to the house, but I just got evicted. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and then the judge, who's the, who's the judge going to side, side for? In most cases, they're going to sign for the lenders. This was not a purchase. This was a lease option. So. And the last one, that's very important, and the, and the fifth part. And I'm just going to write it as time. That's the duration of the contract. So, duration of the contract can get a little tricky here as well. Normally, I do two-year contracts. My broker, when he gives me properties, he gives me a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, or five-year stepped terms, meaning every year it goes up like $3,000. Um, duration of contract can also include how, you know, essentially how long is the tenant buyer have to buy that house from the day that they move in or the day that the contract starts. Now, some people, how I normally do it is that they can buy any time since day one. You know, why restrict them? If they want to buy, buy. If you, it may not appraise at this point on day one, but buy when, if you want to buy now, buy, buy right now. Now, who, why would an owner not want to have you to buy right on the first day? Anybody have a Because he's not making any money. He's, he's not making, making rental he's time. making the purchase price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's another reason? Cash flow. Cash flow, absolutely. Well, another the equity would be losing potentially from a thing. It's, the, the two main ones that I have come across is they do want some cash flow. Secondly, it's shit, that house won't want to appraise. Shut that up. I have to <laughs> The third one is what happens if, um, let's say, Mike, I can pick on you right now. Uh, what happens if you just bought a house and you put Richard uh, as your tenant buyer into your house? And he decides one week later, I'm going to buy this house. I got a hard money loan. I'm going to buy this house. What happens to you? Tax-wise, short-term short -term short capital gains tax if he sells in less than one calendar year. Mm -hmm. So usually, owners will say, you know what, I want you to wait at least one year. That's going to be 365, or in some cases, 366 days, depending if you've got leap day in there somewhere. Because mm -hmm. this one calendar, it's not 365 days, it's November 21st to November 22nd the following year. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So always make sure it's um, you, have, you know, include leap day in case it's... Uh, in your contract. Anybody knows what I mean by leap day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, <clears throat> so let me ask you this, since we've gone up and go over this. It's a little bit more of a complicated question that I was really wanted to go over. Um, the basis of a, of a lease option is the buyer is buying the right to buy the house, the seller is, um, is, uh, is selling the obligation to sell. Can that seller, let's say you've got a tenant buyer, let's say Justin's a tenant buyer, and your name? Mm -hmm. Teresa? Mm -hmm. and, and Teresa's the owner. Can Teresa sell her house to somebody else during Justin's period? Mm -hmm. Actually, I want you to take a minute, talk with each other at the table, and say yes or fine, can, can you, can you not, and why? Say the 
Can the, can the seller, on a, the owner of a house, during the lease option contract period, can they sell that house to another person during the contract period? So, take a minute and discuss what we just Obligated to sell it to that tenant buyer. Who doesn't know? <laughs> who, who wants to venture a guess? Who, on, on the no side. I think it depends how the contract is written. Standard contract. I don't think it's Okay. You say no? Yes, no. Well, what we came up with is that the seller can sell the, con the house and the contract yeah. to somebody else, and that person would still have to honor the lease option agreement. Okay. So let me ask you this. Let's say um, this gentleman up front here owns a 30 unit apartment complex and all of you guys have leases with him. Uh, you sign, you sign your, your various leases with him during your period. Can he sell that, can he sell that uh, apartment complex yes. with you? Yes. But he has signed 30 year agreements with you guys. Right. Doesn't matter. Does he still have to honor all the contracts yeah. that he signed? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now would, would that be the same in the lease option? Yes. Like what you just said there? Yes. So if, um, who do I have? Uh, Teresa, was the, if she had, was the owner of the product, could she sell it to him? But she, uh, well, this lady would have to still honor that contract. Yes. So yes, you can't, the owner can sell at least not your contract to another party. However, that person still has to honor the contract. Um, one of the things he, he I didn't want to I didn't cover tonight. This is actually be a, a much bigger class that I'll be doing because an hour and a half is only so much. Uh, yes, he's talking about um, can the tenant record the document? Yes, they can. They can record it. They, they record the lease option. It'll, it'll be a, a note. It will be a cloud on the title. Um, it's up to you, the owner. Do you want them to do that or not? And then, uh, and then if they were to move out, then you have to find a way to get it taken off. But yes, you can. That does call the title, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to do the transaction. Um, in that case, I say, hey, uh, we're selling the house. You know, if you can take it off for a day, put it back in. You know, it's, that's that's just that. So, so we've covered the purchase price, the option payment, the rent, the rent credit, and the duration. Everything else that's in the uh, that would be in the lease option contract is is up to you guys. You know, if you have anything else, pet restrictions, smoking, all of that stuff is that, that's all in, inconsequential. That's uh, uh, between. Me. So those are the five things that you must have in, uh, in all of these options. So to go back over, the second part that we're going to go over tonight is the pros and the cons. <clears throat> so there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to the owner, a lot of benefits to the tenant, a lot of um, there's a couple of things that are not necessarily great for the owner, and there's not so there's certain cons to the tenant as well. So with the owner, uh, some of the benefits for the owner is the, uh, the owner is actually receiving an option payment, not a not necessarily a security deposit. In some cases, they are paying an actual security deposit. So that an option payment uh, for a pro is non-refundable, as we've already talked about already, is going to be usually two, three, four times the amount of the security deposit. Okay. Secondly, you're going to be getting more in rent. If that person does not buy, you know, you you got a you got a higher rate of return on your house. What if that person does buy? Well, you got market rent in the house during the period he was in there. Okay. 
Another one would be you get a better tent. Okay? Who, who do you think, if you had a house and everything else being equal, who would you rather have in your house? A person that has that desire to buy it or just a renter? <laughs> who takes better care of houses? Renters yeah. or owners? Yeah. Earth them. I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to ask you this out of the blue. <coughs> Assuming a buyer is putting 20% down, a regular buyer, do you, is there a higher interest rate if it's an investment property versus an owner-occupied? Investment side? Why? If tenants take good care of the houses, right? <laughs> so even, even bankers charge a higher interest rate on properties. Okay? Um, we also... If the tenant were to buy, I don't know what he said, but if the tenant were to buy, you're still making the market rent. That's, that's a little bit. Now, there's three different scenarios that normally occur on, on a lease option. One, if it's, uh, this is a, uh, not a lease option, on a, on a property. You rent the house, you either, or, and then, um, or uh, you do a lease option, the option is exercised, or you do a lease option, the option is not exercised. Okay? Now, from the owner's, uh, from the owner's perspective, if he's getting the money or she's getting the money that, uh, that they want, do they care if that tenant buys or not? No. Nope. No. If they buy, fantastic. What do you do? You get your money, do what? Buy something else. If they don't, if they don't buy a, a lease option, what happens? Repeat the process. You made more money. And if it was a rental, yeah, that's where you run the most risk. Yes, sir. So how much, in your experience, how much uh, problems have you had with somebody who puts 20% down, goes through a couple of years of doing rent credits, and then at the end... Well, Does normally we do 2 to 3% down. Yeah, no, we don't go as high as 20%. They're going to do 20% okay. if we sell Just put, They put a decent amount down. They go through a couple of years of, of uh, putting down you know, rent credits, and then they get to the end, and they still can't qualify. How, how much experience have you had with or what, what has happened before when you tell them no, that they, they're still not going to qualify? If, if it's getting close, because uh, I'd like, uh, I always, when I talk to tenant buyers, I would say uh, most landlords, owners that I deal with are family people. They're normal J Janes and Joes. Okay, let me ask you this. Let me, I would say I'm the tenant buyer on, on your house. Yeah. We did a two-year contract, 22 months into it. I need six more months. Would you please give it to me? Or you say, hey, get, the, get the heck out of my house. <laughs> you can always want to negotiate dollars. the terms. Right. At any time. I do, mm -hmm. on, my contra on my lease option contract, I normally do two-year contracts, and then it has one-year renewals. Automatic renewals. Terms will be reset at each renewal period. Because if you're going off a set price, I'm not going to do a 20 year contract on a lease option like I did in a 2014 crisis or 15 crisis. Okay, so you get always, uh, and, I, and my rental contracts are automatic renewals as well. They just go up by 5%. I guess what I was getting at is, have you ever had people be disgruntled and, and kind of like people getting foreclosed on um, new stuff to the house after that? Very rarely. Uh, because uh, people that, that are tenant buyers usually come in with uh, come into the house under, under a much different mindset. They, they, they don't come in under the original mindset. Now, uh, what would and I didn't want to I didn't even go to cover this. What do you think is the industry average of people exercising their option? That's what I was going to ask. That I heard it's like eighty percent don't. Yeah, thirty. Eighty percent is a low number. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. It's going to be closer to ninety percent. About one in four, uh, one in ten. I've got one guy doing one right now, so um, and he had to get some stuff in uh, to the court system going. It's going to close December seventh. He's been in the house two years and now going on two months. He did a two-year contract. Yeah, people exercise all the time. Are there any, yes. Any fair housing issues associated with the lease option program? No, I I don't want to cross fair housing issues. I didn't even have the fair housing con uh, logo on the bottom of all the paperwork. Um, because if you go, don't, just don't discriminate. Yes. I'm assuming that's what you mean by fair housing issues. So I don't discriminate against anyone. It's not, I mean, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> and, and, and if the owner is going to be, wants to do that stuff, then I just say, um, I, I do a pure option agreement with the owner, and either one of us can fire each other at any time. And I have fired owners. I have fired owners. <laughs> But you, know, uh, what are the what are some of the uh, the benefits to the tenants? Well, one of them would be and this is what this is this was a huge uh, program for me back in 2011 to 2012. Back in those days, how many people were buying houses back then? 
2011-2012. Would you say it was a little difficult to get a house on the contract? Multiple cash, uh, multiple offer scenarios, uh, everything. Home buyers could not get anything get done. It's all investors. Now, on a lease option, they're coming to me, and I'm not saying, uh, Jason, uh, yeah, Jason is, a, is an owner, and I've got this gentleman here, we're going to move into the, his house. How much competition do we have on the lease option? Almost zero. He moves into the house, he's, and he's, he's going to buy in 2011. How much competition does he have to exercise his option of the house that he's already in? Zero competition. So there's a huge benefit, especially when, uh, and I strongly appreciate you, Mark, for, for the tenant for the tenant buyer. Also, if they're putting down uh, on, the, on here, we'll go over a mathematical example in a little bit, but uh, say they're putting down 3% here, on the, excuse me, on the option payment. Sure. Let's say it's a $150,000 house, they're there. putting down forty five. Let's say $200,000 house, let's keep the numbers around, and they're putting down $3,000 on a $100,000 house. Mm -hmm. They're getting a $200 rent credit. There's a seat right here. Um, so they're getting a two hundred dollar rent credit, and they're in there for twenty months. How much? How much? How much money? How much money have they put down? Have they gotten in that? Twenty months of two hundred dollars. Okay. Four grand. Okay. Plus the original three grand. Mm -hmm. That's seven thousand dollars. Going up. Oh, is Arthur still here? Yeah. Uh, so they got seven thousand dollars in a hundred thousand dollar house. FHA loan. How much? Down payment. Yeah. Yeah. Estimated closing cost on a purchase. Three, three, three and a half percent. So, do you see right there that how that person is exercising their option after only being there for 20 months with all the seven concessions from this option payment and the rent credit? They're getting the house with almost with no, money, no additional money out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. How beautiful is that? So, huge benefit for the tenant buyer. It's, they're, they're, they're creating their own little savings account. Mm -hmm. So, you're taking their money and you are going to put it in an escrow account? It could be put in an escrow account. Most of my owners own the houses are free and clear. Okay. <coughs> So if the, you can. Yes. If the tenant buyer does not exercise, they lose it all. They lose the rent credit also. That's yes. Considered a down payment legally they, or anything. I've had one owner actually refunded the rent credit because he felt guilty. Yeah. But uh, let me. If you want to, re, if the, you as the owner want to refund it, you can. Normally, uh, those are those are not done. Now, the only way, reason a tenant buyer, and I will come to that in a moment, uh, a tenant buyer would not exercise their option is if they change their mind. Because if they can extend the contract because of credit issues, the third year, fourth year, fifth year, the only reason that they would not buy is I don't want it anymore. Or no worst case scenario, got kind of evicted because of my payment. So which means they're in violation of the contract. Uh, and other ones will be um, there's no moving a second time for the tenant buyer when they move into a house that they're going to lease out. It's not like let me go rent this place and then let's go out and start looking for places. Now I got to go pack and move again, so, which is always inconvenient. And assuming that there's no restrictions on the time, they can buy it any time during the contract. Okay, they don't have to wait and you know, all this other. Once the lender says, "Okay, you're ready to buy," okay, let's turn this option agreement into a purchase agreement and open up escrow, and it has not already been opened because of the option, and you just close it that way. So what are some of the cons, some of the negative uh, aspects for the owner? Well, for one thing, let's say again, using Jason again, he, he did a lease option uh, on one of his houses, and he's tying up that contract or tying up that house for two years. Okay? And if there was a note recorded against it, or not a note, a um, memorandum of interest recorded against it, he cannot really even refinance it without giving those things removed. So it, tie, it, it does kind of tie the owner's hand. And uh, as we said earlier, he could sell the house, but he could only sell it to another investor because that, that new buyer will have to honor that contract. Okay. So if he had to liquidate for whatever reason, divorce, you know, whatever, he, he, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more difficult to you know, get out of him. So some of the, uh, the, the negative benefits or the negative aspects for the tenant is that, and I think uh, Robert here mentioned it earlier, is that the tenant must be working with their credit. And why do you think, who, who asked, you asked the question of how many, um, why I, I asked the question, of how many people don't buy? What do you think the number one reason why they don't buy? They never work in their credit. I send them to multiple credit repair companies, credit optimization companies. Here, please, you've got to get started right now. 
nine months into it, that's usually when the, that's usually when the tenant buyers start flaking out. <laughs> not, that's nine months to a year. Is um, is around that time. It's usually and the reason I don't usually don't buy is because they never work in the credit. And I'm going to go if I have time. Short. Um, part number four. We'll go over a way to help them rebuild the credit. And of course, the biggest negative is if they don't buy, they lose their money. Okay, so is, is everybody learning something so far? I just covered the first two topics. Okay. So number three, how you can make money on a piece of property that you do not own, and I'm not talking about assignments, and I'm not talking about being a realtor. And just have a quick idea. Who has an idea, using the lease option concept that we're talking about right now, how can you make money out of options? Yes, my thought. Do a pure option on it. Well, pure option is kind of, kind of is what a lease option is. I know uh, uh, Coach Howard was talking about this uh, the other day. And it's going to be do doing something known as a sandwich. This is where the fun begins. <clears throat> I, I heard it a couple of people said sandwich option. Does anybody know what a sandwich option is? Oh, this, these are the fun ones. Um, I need a, I need some, a tenant buyer to raise their hand. Is anybody? Defer to someone. Jason, okay. Jason, you okay being the owner again? Okay, fantastic. Uh, on a sandwich option, I would actually go to the owner, Teresa, and I myself, as the investor, would do a lease option with her. Then I would go and advertise it, and I go find Jason to do another lease option with him, thereby sandwiching myself in between the two parties. So now, what have they, I, I don't know how many uh, other people that you guys talked to or heard, what, what's one of the things that they do, especially they talk about buying properties in LLCs and whatever, what do they, what do those uh, gurus, real estate gurus usually say? Own nothing, control everything, right? Sandwich option, am I owning that house? But do I have control over that house? Yes. Absolutely. So the sandwich option is a unique way how you can actually sell a house. Let's say it was Jason wants to buy the house from me, and therefore I've exercised my option with Teresa. Did I ever really own that house? Maybe for that couple of minutes, you know, during uh, the simultaneous close through title company, which is the main does in. But technically, I've never really owned that house. So I'm going to actually you know, let me go through it. So I'm going to go through a little mathematical example. This is just a little mathematical example. This is not always going to be the case with everybody. So, I don't know, black top. so this is me in, in, in between. You can write the word you. I'll just write you here. You. And then let's assume this is the, how long is it? the seller is on this side. 